Hello and good evening everyone and welcome to our webinar this evening, which is the third event in a four part series exploring the topic of adapting to a neurodiversity paradigm, um, affirmative paradigm in child and adolescent services, St. John of God's, CAMS and primary care. My name is Claire O'Neill and I am the Head of Training with Thriving Autistic and a Deputy Principal deeply committed to inclusive practices and I'll be your chair tonight. This event is brought to you as part of a joint initiative by the Children's Clinic, the Adult Autism Practice, Thriving Autistic, Child Diversity, HSC and St. John of God's Community Services Initiative in collaboration with the Autism Special Interest Group of the Psychological Society of Ireland. Throughout, you can submit your questions and comments through the question and answer button on the bottom of the screen. Please do try and get your questions in throughout the presentation as we may not have time in the question and answer section to answer new questions. At the end of the presentation, we will hold a live panel discussion with our contributors and we will try to get to as many of your questions as possible. We won't be able to respond to anyone who raised their hands throughout the webinar, so please make sure that you use the question and answer function instead. At any stage, please feel free to take, to take movement breaks or get drinks as you need them. This is a webinar so nobody can hear or see you. If you are tweeting tonight, please use the hashtag NeuroAffirmativeWebinars and tag the PSI Autism, Autism SIG. If you require CPD points from the PSI, please email autism at psychologicalsociety.ie after the event. We're going to do our very best to keep to time and hopefully everything will run as smoothly as possible. Um, I'd just like to remind you not to share your attendee link with anyone else. Um, the event is completely booked out and sharing your link means that somebody who's registered for the event will miss out on their place. We are recording this event and the recording will be made available publicly online and we are also streaming to Facebook. So please pre-register at the PSI for the final of the webinars in this series, which will take place on Wednesday, the 3rd of November at 8 p.m., where we will explore adapting to a neurodiversity affirmative paradigm in child and adolescent services and in how to apply this to autism diagnostic assessments and report writing. There will also be a workshop for psychologists on neurodiversity affirmative adult autism assessments at this year's PSI annual conference on Wednesday the 10th of November. And I'm very excited to say that coming in 2022, there will be a release of a book called the Neurodiversity Affirmative Adult Autism Assessment Handbook, which has been published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers. Now, without further delay, I am delighted to launch proceedings. Tonight, we will first hear from Jessica K. Doyle, who will give a forward tonight to tonight's events. Then we will hear from the St. John of God's CAMS team about neurodiversity affirmative changes they've made in their practice. Then we will hear from Juliana from the HSC Primary Care about her project. And finally, this will be followed by a half an hour question and answer session. I'm now going to pass you over to Jessica Kay for the forward tonight. Jessica is autistic, works as an assistant psychologist at the Adult Autism Practice, um, is a sensory processing project officer at T uh, TCD Sense, an independent researcher and a director of Thriving Autistic. Thank you very much, everyone. Hello. I'm going to do the forward. By now, we should all be aware of the devastating effects of persisting with harmful stereotypes. Supports grounded in medical model assumptions and engaging in practice that encourage, encourages masking autistic features. How it creates barriers for authentic development, leading to isolation, loneliness, disconnection, threats to mental health, and without adequate support, far too early mortality. There is the issues issue of unequal resources offered to autistic individuals struggling with their mental health, which often insists on putting the person first, but does not recognize the person as autistic. 
or ignores the need for mental health support because the person is autistic. Tonight, we will hear from two teams who are paving the way to changing these practices and providing strong supports for autistic children and adolescents that acknowledges, accepts, and values the autistic experience. These teams are starting by adapting their own services to be neurodiversity affirmative. Oh, sorry. We need much more though. If everyone could make little changes, then we could all act as cascading pebbles moving the river to flow. It is much more than simple language change though. We need to work to build strong foundations behind these changes to fully shift to a neurodiversity paradigm. Through our actions, our work ethos, challenging old assumptions we have, through our communication, how we think about, talk about and support autistic individuals and how we make space, share and design this world for all neurotypes. We need to truly recognize autism as a different yet entirely valid neurotype. Regardless of co-occurring conditions, need for support, diverse communication, learning and expression styles, all autistic people have the right to dignity, autonomy, privacy, respect, mental and physical well-being, inclusion, freedom, and when needed, the respectful support from a person they trust to fully access all their rights. Language changes cannot sit above a hollow surface. It's not as simple as using feel-good neuroaffirmative language and calling it a day. Behind these changes cannot hide a hollow surface. It can start with language, but don't stop there, keep walking. Work with others to learn more about ways to change and adapt and understand the neurodiversity paradigm. Work with the autistic community, collaborate, and together we can connect and build strong foundations. As Vincent van Gogh said, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. And as Helen Keller said, alone we can do so little, together we can do so much. Now that's enough for me. I will now pass you back to Claire to introduce tonight's presentations. So much, um, Jessica, for that. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce the St. John Agalsk um, CAMS team. Um, Dr. Don, oh God, Dr. Sonia Morris is a clinical psychologist with CAMS. Sonia has worked in varying capacities and across various services with autistic people for the last 15 years. Paula Monaghan is an occupational therapist working with CAMS. Before training as an occupational therapist, Paula worked for five years as a support worker in a service for autistic adults. And Caroline McCrory, who unfortunately could not make it tonight, is a senior speech and language therapist working with CAMS and has worked in primary care speech and language therapy and also in early intervention after graduating from Trinity in 2016. Struggle to find the unmute button there for a second. <laughs> uh, just to introduce ourselves before we start so that you know who is who. My name is Sonia. Hi, and I'm Paula. Um, so just thank you so much for having us here this evening and allowing us to, to tell, you know, the very, very beginnings of our um, neuroaffirmative journey and changes um, in a CAM service. So yeah, thank you for organising and, and letting us be part of it. Great. So, yeah, this myself and Sonia work in CAMS, which um, I'm for those who are aware, it's the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service. So CAMS is a free specialist service for those children and young people under the age of 18 who are experiencing moderate to severe mental health difficulties and need treatment from a team of mental health professionals. So some of the difficulties we see in CAMS are moderate to severe anxiety disorders, depression, eating disorders, um, thoughts of suicide or self-harm, psychosis, and moderate to severe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, and ADHD falls within the remit of CAMS because it's often treated by medication that's prescribed by a psychiatrist. So Sonia and I work on Team A, um, which is based out of that lovely clinic in the picture in um, Rathgar. So there's three teams um, based out of Rathgar. 
Um, and each CAMS team is multidisciplinary. So it is kind of, there's a consultant psychiatrist, psychiatric registrars, psychologists, uh, nurses, occupational therapy, speech and language therapy, social workers, and social care workers that form our teams. Okay, so nowhere in that description does it actually say autism. Um, and somebody was recently reading the operational guidance for CAMS and sent me a voice message and was asking, um, it actually says there that you don't work with uh, autistic people and what is the story with CAMS? And it was a very good point. So this slide is just to illustrate um, where we as a CAMS are coming from when we're talking about our work with the autistic population. So this um, table that I'm presenting here is from a recent systematic review um, of uh, quite a number of, of papers that were um, reviewed and recorded for the stats, so 96 papers. Unfortunately, I don't have stats for Ireland about co-occurrence rates specifically, um, or indeed specifically for, for our team or our service, uh, but these will do good enough. Um, and I suppose it's just to illustrate, I suppose, what our work is within a CAM setting. So um, unfortunately, the co-occurrence rate of mental health concerns with autism is quite high. Jessica mentioned in her forward there that quite rightly, you know, if autism goes unrecognized and unsupported, um, particularly in the early years, it can lead to mental health concerns. And we certainly see that within a CAM setting. So Paula mentioned that ADHD currently finds its home within the CAMS and um, that is a, a, another neurodivergence. And this paper um, uh, suggests that the co-occurrence rate with autism is as high as 28% if you take the average across those 96 papers. So like we have half of the caseload on team A is, is ADHD. Um, so if you take that co-occurrence rate, we already have a lot of autistic people that are attending our service. Then we lead down to the mental health concerns and unsurprisingly, given the environment and how it's set up at the moment, um, it, it being non-conducive to uh, being autistic, uh, anxiety disorders are, are quite high in the autistic population, as high as 20% is estimated by this paper. And I've put the, the link, by the way, the, um, the paper that we're quoting from just there down below. It was the most recent one I could find. So if anybody wants to read the paper in full, that information is there. Depressive disorders then 11%, obsessive compulsive disorders 9%, bipolar disorders 5%, and schizophrenia spectrum disorders 4%. So you can see quite clearly from that table that um, a lot of autistic people are coming to our service with moderate severe mental health concerns and or ADHD. So when we're talking about the changes that we've made on our team, it is from that perspective. So why change? Um, so I suppose since the label of autism has been about, it has been viewed in, in the medical terms. And as, we, as Sonia mentioned, we are working alongside young autistic people who are also experiencing moderate to severe um, mental health difficulties. And we recognise that there are different ways to look and, and think about autism that might better support the young people that we see. So we became really aware of the emerging neurodiversity movement that was growing online, particularly on social media and from the young people that we were working with in the clinic. We started, you know, by really like looking outwards and, and trying to learn as much as we could from the from the community itself. So it really started with, with listening and learning from those young people who were attending our service um, about their experiences. Um, and this led to the creation of, of a new group um, within the service um, where young people were able to explore their autistic identity and what it means to them. Um, and we will talk a little bit more um, about that group as the presentation goes on. Just to give a brief overview, I suppose, of some of the changes that we're going to have a chat about today. And to emphasize, as has been emphasized in all the previous webinars so far, that this is, um, we're, we're in no ways perfect on our team. And we still have a lot of learning to do and a lot of change to do. Um, and as Jessica also mentioned in her forge, you know, it, it starts, um, you know, with, with a different way of, of language, of using language, and then it branches out from there. And we are very much at the start of our journey um, as a CAMS team. But some of the, the things that we've done have been really impactful and really helpful. And um, I suppose we see our role here tonight, if there are other CAMS professionals here and other CAMS clinicians, as, as showing that there is a different way to look at autism, that there is a different way of working with the autistic people that attend our service, and that even small changes can have a big impact um, and, and can be adapted within that CAMS way of working, that CAMS model. 
So the ones that we've decided to focus on today are, are the ones that I suppose have made that biggest change on our team and the biggest change to our service. So we're going to talk a little bit about collaboration and collaborative projects that we've been working on outside of ourselves. We're going to talk a little bit about the changes that we, we make when we first meet a family into the service, um, which we sometimes call it intake assessment, but on our team we call it a triage assessment. We're going to talk about you know, when we do do autism assessments and what they might look like um, within our service and on, on our team specifically. And then we're going to spend um, a bigger chunk of time, hopefully, if, if time allows, uh, if we don't get carried away with ourselves, talking about uh, interventions and how we've changed the way we're working with um, young people that attend our service with moderate to severe mental health concerns um, and how we account for their autism and see their autism when they're in our service uh, with a specific emphasis on the Being Me group that we developed. So yeah, so one of the first um, changes that we made um, it started, I suppose, by, I was saying we started by, by looking outwards and, and where could we make the changes. So we noticed, um, I suppose, a gap in some of the literature and resources that we were providing to families and, and young people attending the service. And we really wanted to be sure that if we were providing um, young people with information that it was respectful and helpful and it was what people actually needed. So we wanted to, to, you know, to make connections and, and to learn and to get as much information as we could from the autistic community themselves. So we, we reached out to As I Am, who I'm, I'm sure we're all very familiar with, our, our national um, kind of autism charity in Ireland. Um, and, and what started as, as, you know, kind of linking in um, and kind of opening up conversation has actually spiraled and led to the creation of, of three resource packs. Um, as a joint collaboration between between our service and as I am, so we we started developing um, resource pack on on starting your autism journey, and this was something you know we were like we really wanted to create as as we were recognizing the the unique kind of position that our service played for a certain cohort of people who were starting their autism journey, um, like maybe at a later stage, maybe in adolescence, and and through. Um, a child and adolescent mental health service. Um, so this booklet is available um, online on the As I Am website. Um, and from this booklet, it led on to the creation of two further resource packs. Um, one post-diagnostic resource pack, um, which is due to be released in the coming weeks. And one final booklet specifically on, on autism and girls, which is a particular um, group that we, we work quite a bit with in our service. Um, so we will hopefully be releasing that early next year. Um, we've only had the, um, this booklet um, for a few months um, and we've, we've given it out quite a bit to, to families and the feedback has been really, really positive. And, and what's been positive um, about this, this collaboration as well as for those starting their autism journey that, journey, that it's starting with a neuroaffirmative message um, you know, from the beginning. And we're really hoping that we can kind of continue this work and, and collaboration um, with As I Am or, or with, with other um, communities out there. Okay, so moving on to the triage assessment uh, or intake assessment, depending on the, the team that you're working on in our service. Um, as Paula said, sometimes when, um, when a young person comes through our service, it's the start of their autism journey. Um, and that is because oftentimes uh, a young person is presenting to our service with moderate to severe mental health concerns um, or concerns uh, that aren't moderate to severe, but uh, you know, they're coming in for, for an assessment to, to see if they meet that threshold. Um, and what might become um, a query in the assessment or a parent in the assessment is that um, there's, there's an underlying autism that has not been, been diagnosed or uh, the young person has, has not been self-identifying as. Um, and in that triage assessment then, or that intake assessment, it might be the first time that um, parents and the young people have, have heard the word autism um, as describing their young person. So having that booklet from, from As I Am has been really beneficial uh, for us as a service because when uh, young people and parents are leaving this meeting, it's nice uh, for them to have something to go away with so that they can process that information. And um, there's excellent signposting in that booklet as well for them to find out more information. And also for us as clinicians to have something to give them that is you know, accurate and respectful of the autistic community. Um, and we know that that is safe information to be giving or appropriate information to be giving. So um, we're very grateful that we've had that collaboration 
and that we have that booklet available to us and across team members as well for, for them to be giving out at, at their triage and intake assessments. The other thing that we're trying to do at our um, intake assessment is trying to break down stigma that's associated with autism and um, that is that is there for, for many different reasons um, but uh, which, which needs addressing. And one of the things that we try to do is right from the get go to give that neuroaffirmative message. So when we're introducing the idea of autism to a family as a possibility, the language use that we're using is in line with the wishes of the autistic community, and, and, uh, or at least we hope so. Um, and we are, we are trying to give a, a message of strength and positivity and a message of it being a legitimate difference in this world. And to contextualize the young person's mental health concerns if appropriate. And um, so that uh, the young person and their family can understand why this young person might be struggling so much or might be clashing with the environment so much or may, you know, um, be struggling with their identity or finding a reason for why it is uh, they feel the way they do. Um, so at all times, we're quite cognizant that this could be a possibility for this young person. And by by naming that in the session, we're hoping that that reduces stigma associated with autism as well and that they're getting that positive message right from the outset. So um, we really do place uh, great importance on open communication, neuroaffirmative language, and also there's a huge psychoeducation piece as well within that triage assessment. The diagnostic assessment, I forgot that this was my slide too. <laughs> I was like, oh, the shock, it's me again. Um, the diagnostic assessment then as well. Um, so just to, um, I suppose, to clarify the role of CAMS within this, because there often is a lot of confusion about who does what within the services. Um, obviously, the remit of CAMS, as we outlined, outlined at the very beginning, is in the, the supporting young people with moderate to severe mental health concerns. Now, the practice across CAMS across this country, and, and indeed across teams within Lucina, is very different, and Team A are, are piloting a new way of working at the moment. Um, but we are, we mentioned the operational guidance for, for CAMS at the very beginning of, of this meeting, and we as a team are trying as much as possible to abide by the operational guidance of CAMS uh, that have been laid out by the HSC. Um, so where does that leave us with autism and with autism assessments? We do do autism assessments, uh, but we do have um, a, a pathway, an autism pathway on our team. And one of the things um, that I suppose justifies us doing an autism assessment within our service is, is in um, the support of young people with moderate to severe mental health concerns. So we see it very much on our team that um, if somebody is, um, is, is possibly autistic and hasn't been assessed yet, that that in and of itself, knowing that about yourself can be therapeutic and can cause um, a shift in moderate severe mental health concerns. Um, and we see the process of being assessed as well as an opportunity for therapy, that assessment can be used as a therapeutic tool. So in order for it to be therapeutic, the young person needs to be aware of it. So uh, we are trying in as much as possible um, navigating um, that with parents, that the young person be involved in as much as possible in the assessment process. So these are some of the changes that we've made when we are assessing autism in the treatment of their mental health. So um, if a young person, we want them to be involved and we want them to be on board with the assessment. So if a young person uh, says they don't want the assessment, then we need to have a real good think about that. Um, obviously, we are using quite a neuroaffirmative language when we're introducing the idea. So it, it actually hasn't come up um, that a young person has said that they don't want the assessment. Um, but thinking about it now and as a team, if we are reflecting that, we, we would probably um, you know, have to have a think about that. We use the autistic voice quite a lot um, in our assessment as well. So particularly at the beginning stages for psychoeducation, we provide a lot of um, uh, content that's created by the autistic community, um, a lot of literature that's created as well by the autistic community, so autistic authors, explaining what autism is and how it might relate to that young person. We try and tailor that in as much as possible to the young person's age and um, to the stage that they're at in their knowledge of, of what autism is. Um, and what they might need as well um, to, um, uh, to progress with the assessment in a, in a meaningful way. The components of the assessment as well have, have slightly shifted. So, um, you know, we, we do use the, the DSM-5 for our assessments and we base them off that and we continue to use the ADIOR and the ADOS, which are gold standards um, in autism assessment. But what we try in as much as possible to do is change the language use when we're using those tools to make sure that we are taking a strengths-based perspective, that we are respecting um, communication difference when we're, when we're looking at the communication sections, um, and as well that we, we're accounting for the experience of the autistic person. So rather than looking at deficits, we're looking at difference. 
Um, so we are still using those tools, uh, but we've adapted the way that we are using them. Another component that we're also trialing using on our team is um, a clinical interview with the young person. And this very much depends on the young person and again, where they're at and stage in their journey. But again, with the um, aim of including the young person in as much as possible in our assessment process, we want their voice to be heard. And of course, all the literature that's coming out um, about um, masking and camouflaging, sometimes the tools that we're using aren't very good at picking that up um, or aren't factoring that in. So to prioritize the voice of the young person in the assessment, we've started uh, introducing an additional component, which is a sit down with one of the clinicians on the team. And we go through the diagnostic criteria using neuroaffirmative language. And we try and support the young person in articulating their own experience of, of the world and how they prefer to communicate, what their experience of social relationships has been like in the past and present, what, uh, how they experience the world from a sensory perspective, you know, what their preferences are with regards to routine, how they use their body to cope and um, manage large emotions or just to feel pleasure. All of those different things we would be using in the assessment so that we get the young person's voice. So we get in as much as possible what it's like to be them and to understand them as a person. Um, leading on from that as well, obviously, um, you, it would be, uh, I must not to talk about the report, We've also started to change our reports. And again, these are these are stages of progression and we're trialing all these things and they are very much um, our team seeing what works and perhaps what doesn't work. And we're constantly seeking feedback from, from the parents and the young people that attend our service about what has been working, what hasn't. Um, and the report is something that we've, we've recently changed. We're trying to shorten them a little bit so they're not information heavy. And again, um, we're, we're trying in as, uh, in as much as possible to use that neuroaffirmative language to make sure that we are focusing on the strengths of the young person and on and using the word the labels of difference as opposed to deficit um, and again the feedback session is um, taking all of those uh, qualities and all those values into account as well so in as much as possible having the young person present and the feedback session because our assessments are now taking a longer amount of time um, because we, we do have these extra components and we are using it as a piece of therapy by the time we get to the feedback session uh, we're hoping that, uh, that the outcome is, is, is not surprising to anybody, that it's, it's more of a piece of um, solidifying uh, some identity. And then we go on to the um, um, post-diagnostic support work that we do on our team. But the feedback session is, is more about bringing all the information together and reflecting on the person and then collaboratively, um, you know, um, talking about autism as, as a, an identity piece for that young person and how that fits within the family and, and their system and bringing it back then to their, to their mental health needs um, and talking about what the, the um, you know, what this means for, for the management of, of their mental health going forward, how this would be a positive for supporting those mental health needs and looking outwards then from the individual about what in the environment might be contributing to those mental health needs that we can address them to. This is me again, my goodness. <laughs> I won't, tell, I won't talk too much on this, you're probably <laughs> bored of my voice now at this stage. Um, just a brief um, introduction about adapting therapy on our team. So I mentioned there that at the feedback session, we start looking a bit outwards if, if there's a confirmed diagnosis of autism there, if the, if the young person is autistic. Um, and one of the things that we're becoming increasingly conscious of on our team is that social model of disability. So if a young person is presenting with moderate severe mental health concerns, we're not just focusing on, um, or focusing at all, um, on change within the person. Sometimes we're looking more outward as well. Um, so looking at differentials. So if a young person is presenting with um, uh, what appears to be a depressive episode, considering as a differential autistic burnout or as a contributing factor to that. Um, similarly, we're very conscious um, in our interventions as well for, for other presentations that we are not um, in as much as possible, as, as, as much as we can voice to it, um, uh, teaching children not to be their authentic self. So trying very much to uh, embrace the authentic self and um, you know, uh, to support young people in being true to themselves. So how this might have a repercussion for CAMS, the thing that springs to my mind is our OCD interventions. We do a group called Boston Back OCD. And you saw from uh, one of the first slides that we presented that the co-occurrence rate of OCD in, in autism is, is quite high. 
And one of the things that, uh, you know, in the, in the treatment uh, and managing of, of OCD, one of the um, gold standard interventions or the um, evidence-based interventions is exposure res response prevention. So you would be um, stopping uh, young people from engaging in compulsive behaviours. So in this context, you can see why it would be very important for a young person to know that they're autistic and for the facilitators of that group to know that a young person is autistic because we want what we don't want to happen is an intervention that's targeting stimming behaviours or self-soothe behaviours that are conducive to that young person um, and important for that young person to engage in. So that's just one example of how, uh, you know, um, we are considering the whole person when they're coming into uh, our service, whether they have a pre-existing um, diagnosis um, and are here for moderate severe mental health intervention, or uh, we have been the ones that have been uh, done that therape therapeutic um, assessment piece and they're going on for, for forward intervention as well. So that's just one example, but uh, what we're gonna focus on now is uh, the group. So the Being Me group, um, this is, um, as Anya mentioned and we mentioned earlier, um, a, a kind of a post-diagnostic support group um, that we have been piloting um, within the service for over a year now. So it's on its fifth or sixth um, round <laughs> um, and it started initially on our team and it's now been offered across the three teams um, in Rathgar. It's undergone some adaptations and, and changes um, based on feedback from the participants, you know, from the pilot to how we're running it now. Um, the overall aims of the group really was to explore, like in a strengths-based neuroaffirmative way, the autistic identity and experiences. Um, the format of the group, I suppose we always started with an open day um, to allow the young people and their families to learn a little bit more about the group, its format, its structure, to, you know, have a space where you can kind of ask some questions about the group and an opportunity for, for young people to make requests um, about the group, about topics that we could cover, about their communication preferences um, before attending the group. So the group then itself consisted of, of two components. So we ran a, a parent group and then a group um, for, for the young people. So the parent group, um, has started with three one one and a half hour sessions um although this is something that we are looking at um and hopefully um increasing because i think the feedback from parents is that they would like um more more than three sessions um so the the parent group um aims to kind of you know challenge some of that stigma um around autism um we're looking at the history um, of autism and it's you know it's portrayal in the media over the years and, and we try to you know to challenge that and, and use a, a neuroaffirmative approach um, to, to break that down. Um, it has provided the parents you know um, of young people attending our service a, a space to kind of connect with other parents and and we recognize that the, the parents attending this group you know are, are in a unique situation they are the parents of a young recently diagnosed um, autistic person, but who is also experiencing um, mental health um, concerns. So the feedback ha has been um, really positive from parents. And, and while we, we have only had the three sessions, parents themselves have made lots of connections and, and you know, often shared details and, and continued on that support themselves. But hopefully we are hoping to maybe be able to add a few more sessions to the, to the parent group going forward. And then the young person group, um, I'll, yeah. I'll hand you back over to Sonia to tell you a little bit more on that. Um, so the, the young person group is actually where it started. Um, we developed the group and then quickly realised that, that we, we needed as well support from parents too in the home so that um, there would be systemic change, that it wouldn't just be the, the young person um, that would be exposed to, to some of the ideas and to some of the content that we, we bring up in the group. Um, I suppose the, the primary reason for the young person group was um, we, we were noticing that uh, after diagnosis, there was very little opportunity for exploration of what that diagnosis means for that young person and how they were connecting to that diagnosis as well. Um, so we have a, a, you know, quite a mixed response as well, given the fact that most of the time for our young people, it's a later in life diagnosis. 
So adapting your identity, especially when it's not coming from yourself, but when the idea of, of being autistic might be coming from a clinician that's meeting with you and your family, and um, you know, incorporating uh, that um, that label and uh, that way of experiencing the world and, and um, into, into your sense of self, um, can often need some support. Um, and as Paula already mentioned, one of the other primary aims of the group is to, is to reduce stigma. So people come to our service with um, lots of different backgrounds of knowledge of what autism is. And some of it is uh, dominated by the history of autism and uh, media portrayals of autism. And um, so sometimes again, integrating that, that sense of self uh, with regards to autism um, can, can be sometimes tricky for a young person or they just need some space to, to look at what it means for them. So th that was the rationale for the group. Uh, for the young people. Um, but we were also quite conscious that we're coming uh, at this group from the stance of, of clinicians uh, with all good intentions, but uh, sometimes not what, what the young people need to hear. Uh, so what we do in the group is we prioritize the autistic voice. So we're facilitators of the group, but the content is all delivered by um, the autistic community. So we use TED Talks, we use um, newspaper articles that are written by autistic people, um, we use uh, YouTube videos, um, lots of uh, like uh, ex ex excerpts from, from different pieces of literature, whatever we can find and whatever is helpful. And uh, a lot of the time, this content is provided by the young people themselves and we carry it over into different groups too. Um, and we always seek feedback as well of whether or not it's useful. And the topics of conversation are also driven very much by the young people. So we have a huge range of things that we could talk about and have content prepared. But oftentimes the young people have their own agenda and they have different things that they want to talk about and we run with that as well um, and we the, so the group is constantly moving and adapting and very much differs every every time it's run because the groupings of people are different within it and um, so the the idea is that it is a space to talk about um issues that are uh, present within the autistic community and how they relate to yourself we do spend quite a bit of time talking about language it's always one the young people are, are quite keen to talk on um, and then the other aim of the group as well is peer connection. So much like the parents often appreciate being linked in with other parents, young people also appreciate being linked in with other young people. So what we what we tend to see is a uh, lovely, um, you know, uh, peer connection being made within these groups that carries on outside the group as well. Um, one thing to note as well is that uh, not only does the content change in the group, but also how we run the group too. So we've had, um, you know, groups that are run completely on Zoom. And within that, what that allows for is um, differences in social communication to be um, respected. So we may have people with their cameras on who are very comfortable with unmuting and um, sharing their opinions and contributing to conversation. And then we may have other people who prefer uh, written communication. And what's lovely about um, using Zoom and one of the, the marvels of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, new ways of doing therapy is that we have the chat function. And it allows uh, young people who have that communication preference to be able to contribute in the way that they prefer to. So we tend to favor Zoom um, over face to face. Then we also have people on Zoom who would like to attend, but do not want to contribute. Um, and, that's, and that's perfectly fine. They might have their camera off and their mic off. And uh, we see that as a legitimate way to participate as well. And um, so being there and listening it's better than not being there and listening. Um, so we respect that preference too. There was a cohort that um, um, did want face-to-face -face as well. So we ran our first, as soon as it was allowed pretty much by the clinic, we were the first face-to-face -face group in our clinic um, after the pandemic. And that finished a few weeks ago. So we had uh, young people come in twice a week for three weeks. Um, and that was lovely as well. And um, we ran it as a camp once as well, the suggestion of, of some young people. So during the summer, it was definitely the summer, yeah. We had it run daily as well on Zoom, uh, which was nice too. And that did um, uh, you know, foster uh, really good um, peer connections that, uh, that continued afterwards, uh, as did the face-to-face -face one as well. So we're looking at maybe a, a blended hybrid of all of those uh, components. And we're constantly seeking the feedback of the young people too. And one thing that I will say about this group is that uh, it is my favorite one to run and uh, people who tend to get involved in it also say the same thing. It's a beautiful group and um, it's uh, really enjoyable. It's very energizing when you're in that space and it, it's just wonderful hearing young people be so passionate about who they are and 
what they relate to um, and it's all centered around autism so for me it's um it's a, it's a fantastic group to be involved in and 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 that's all down to, to the kids that that do take part and uh does it have any positive impact on mental health we don't know yet um but the feedback is always really really good uh, really good from it we get uh, the loveliest of compliments um we had uh, it's not a complete waste of time and it wasn't as bad as what i thought in amongst them which uh from, from those kids is like high <laughs> praise some of the time uh so it is um uh, it seems like it's a, a a mutually loved group and we do get requests that it continue in very different formats as well so we're looking into that as well how we might continue that connection with the young people too so going forward um I suppose we recognize that like we are still you know learning this is the very very you know just the the beginning of you know our our journey and, and our changes um within this service so we, we hope to continue to learn and grow and and I think like Sonia was saying we are learning so much each time that we run this group you know we're able to kind of work with that feedback and, and make some changes and, and hopefully we're making it better um and and for the young people who are who are attending um we have started um an autism working group um within the the wider um uh cam service um and we are hoping you know to, to standardize actually um, our, our kind of autism assessment and, and post-diagnostic support pathway across all of the teams. Um, we are, you know, I suppose really eager to, to learn um, ourselves and to keep learning. So we are open, you know, to some research and, and, and ongoing training. And I think like Sonia mentioned earlier, if, if there's people out there watching this, you know, who are keen to, to collaborate on, on any way, we'd be really, really interested in that yeah. too. We, we really want to do some research on, on the Being Me group because um, all of it has been quite informal feedback, which has kept us going. If the feedback was, was coming back as, as a negative, we would have stopped it, but we're finding huge benefit. And um, so I think that's the next step in our journey is, is to see, OK, is this is this worthwhile in a, in a very meaningful way? Um, uh, through through I think qualitative methodology or um, just just to see what that the experience of being in the group is like for a young person. Um, and then with regards to training as well, I think um, one of the things that was mentioned was that we shouldn't be keeping the script just to ourselves. Um, and we have um, opened up, so this was a, a team A group um, initially, and uh, we've opened up this group to um, the other teams in our service. Um, but one of the things that we did want to find out uh, after listening to our spiel about it, uh, was if uh, other people would be interested in something like that, like should we be should we be putting something together for for distribution, or should we um, be sharing this information with the content with other people? And we've uh, put together. I know we've gone over time, so that the chair hasn't shouted at us yet. Um, but um, we've uh, found this really useful um, uh, quiz um, survey tool. Uh, if you go to slider.com. And it will ask for the ID number if you just pop CAMS in there and um, it will bring you to a um, and you can use it on your phone or anything like that or whatever device you're on. It will bring you to just uh, this question and it's just a very, very brief one. Uh, you can tick multiple boxes. So if you could tick whether training is, is something that you would actually be interested in and what type of service that you're in so that we can get uh, an idea and then we might put together like a, a business case or something or it might put together some materials for distribution. Like that. but that's us thank you so much for your time and attention and listening to the start of our journey Paula and um, Paula and Sonia thank you so much for that that was such um an interesting um presentation and such such um a positive way of working and I love the way that um the children and young people are at the center of everything that you're doing so thank you for that and there are some really interesting questions and comments and compliments for for your um presentation so thank you very much um so um please remember to put in your questions for the for the CAMS team who will be joining us again later for the live panel discussion and now I'd like to introduce Dr Juliana Azevedo, clinical clinical psychologist in HSE Primary Care Service. She's been piloting a new neurodiversity affirmative pathway for the child services in her area for children who further um, need, who need a further autism assessment and will be giving the final presentation tonight before our question and answer session. Thank you, Juliana.
Thank you very much, Claire. And let me see if I can share my slide here. Um, well, that, that was really, really good to hear. Uh, Sonia and Paul, very much for, for the presentation. It is um, very refreshing. Um, so it's interesting to see how I'm like you are in one pole of the services and I'm in the opposite one. So <clears throat> I will be talking about kind of the, the a primary care um, service or, or pathway um, that we are incorporating in our, in our service. So first of all, I would like to thank Davida, Davida, Jessica, and all the organizers and participants for all their amazing work putting together these seminars and say that I feel very honored to be part of it. Um, I also want to echo what everybody has been saying in terms of um, you know, my journey or this journey in terms of the neurodiversity affirmative one, which is really kind of a journey. Like it, it, I, I know I have a lot to learn about and to implement in my work. Um, and I hope um, to obviously continue that, that uh, journey. Um, I also would like to thank my colleagues, um, my principal, um, Dr. Graham Connor, but as well as speci and especially uh, APs that have been working with me in this journey, which are in, and they are fabulous. So Connor O'Kelly and Olwyn Money, and also some trainees like Catherine Kinsella, who made this pathway possible. Um, I would like to thank a lot kind of the families that I've met during this time, especially the kids and teens that had given me such an insight about their lives, passions, struggles, and were so open to open and honest about themselves. So just to give you a context, my presentation will be based on my experience of developing and implementing a pathway which you, we are calling developmental clinic in our primary care service. Um, so that is the mission that it, it, our mission in, in CH09, um, and those are the services that we provide in, in Grange Gorman primary care. That's where I'm based. So we provide consultations, drop-in clinics, developmental clinics, and other interventions. Um, and primary care is really the kind of the first entrance to psychology, if you like. Um, so we work with mild to moderate presentations. And most of the, our referrals are our referrals come from um, GPs, other professionals, but also self-referrals. Um, so this pathway is about that journey in terms of identifying or, or you know, listening to, to, to clients in, in a different way, but also in relation to my own experience of trying to recognize value and incorporate what can be translated as differences into my work. I'm originally from Brazil, so I'm used to be seeing as different on a daily basis. But in my view, being a foreigner invites me to be in a very privileged place and allows me to be super curious about other people's experiences, cultures, beliefs, distinct ways of thinking and being in this world. So one of my first jobs as a psychologist was in, dis in a disability service working with autistic children. So when I moved to primary care, I thought I had the background needed to identify and refer kids for further assessment. Um, but I will never forget um, some of my clients in primary care that taught me so much about the importance of being curious and inquisitive. So Dee was six year old who loved dogs. He also loved to have cereal for breakfast with one spoon of chocolate mixed with his milk. He draw dogs before going to bed and that calmed him down. He didn't line up cars. 
He didn't have tantrums. He hated to be separated from his mom. At the time, I thought that a parenting group uh, for parents of kids experiencing anxiety would definitely assist his mother to understand and maybe to be better able to deal with his separation anxiety. She did the group. We met again for a couple of sessions, but no matter what we did, his presentation didn't change. One day, his mother mentioned that going to the supermarket with him was very difficult because every time they were near enough to the freeze area, he would get impatient and agitated. So we then refer to assessment of needs, AON, and he was diagnosed with autism. Or story of Jay, who was so creative and imaginative that wrote stories about superpowers. But the reason for a referral was daydreaming in school and not being able to concentrate. And like them, I met many. And as you can see from the slide, these are some of the reasons for referrals to primary care. When you read them, different hypotheses come to your mind, but autism might not, come, might not be one of them. So without, a, without proper further investigation, they, I mean kids and parents, are normally placed on intervention waiting lists in primary care services. Their families wait for a long time to be seen and the interventions that we provide might work, but more commonly will not work. So I started to realize that me with my curiosity, which I was so proud of, didn't really capture the needs of those kids and families. In my defense, the reason for referrals fitted really well, the understanding and criteria for primary care, but maybe my questions, curiosity, hypothesis, were not the correct ones because autism didn't really fit anymore into what I had learned. It was then when I started using our advice clinic, which is a drop-in clinic to try and understand a bit more about those referrals. So I would ask parents to come to the advice clinic, uh, bring their kids with them. And you know, maybe in that way, I would maybe have a better understanding of the cases. But I realized that suddenly the advice clinic appointments were inundated of those referrals and I felt I needed to do something different. So we started studying and understanding more about autism through YouTube videos, Twitter, books, uh, and learning from our colleagues about their own experiences. I've also learned a lot about autism with Davida, Maeve, Jessica, Tara, and it was like that I was seeing my service fitted and, and, and that made sense. So that's when we thought about the pathway. So we created this new pathway in our service in which every single referral was going to be read or viewed from a new lens. But in order to do that, we had to come up with questions that would instigate parents to think about their kids in a very holistic and strength-based way. We put together a questionnaire with strength-based questions draw from the DSM-5 criteria. So those questions would incorporate kind of all those aspects here, but in a very strength and, and, and um, language kind of strength language uh, way. So the assistant psychologist would phone parents and ask those questions in a more inquisitive, curious, but very respectful approach. The parents' narratives and stories were discussed on our referral meetings, and some cases were contacted by us after this original discussion and advised to apply for further autism assessment. Other referrals were a bit more unclear, and I felt I needed to meet the child in order to have a better sense of their own experiences. They were invited to one session with me, which was face-to-face -face or sometimes online, and most of them in the presence of their kids, or sorry, in their parents. And a decision was made after that interaction. 
So the meetings with the kids and, and teens, they were focusing on strengths, view of the, their view of words, interactions, friendship, communication, um, language style, preferences, physical movements. And with the younger ch children, we would play with them, letting them conduct the play, explore the imagination, collaboration, and etc. After meeting with um, the kids and their parents, we contact parents uh, to discuss and, and what we had observed or, you know, the, during that particular meeting. And it was more like a conversation, you know, rather than a more diagnostic type of thing. So it was always about kind of my understanding of what I had experienced during the session, but also parents' uh, understanding of their kids and how they, um, how they were in that particular session with us. Uh, so the conversation with parents after that appointment were always very informative, but also sincere and hard. Approaching autism or the possibility of autism with parents was difficult due to the fact that the word can be interpreted or the autism can be interpreted and viewed in a very negative way sometimes. And mind you, sometimes like we were the first ones to, to name autism, something that might have not been even thought about by those parents. So rephrasing and reframing autism with parents made all the difference. Also showing my own vulnerability in relation to my hypothesis not being correct and, and advising them to go for a further uh, assessment. But once we focus on strengths and once we focus on what kids um, were doing, um, I think that conversation, that discussion and conversation was much more approachable, if you like. Um, we would discuss with parents uh, what were uh, the difficulties they were encountering and also guide them or provide them with material that we thought would be helpful for their kids at that particular time. Um, I think we also would, um, and, and in those materials, like the, those materials would incorporate kind of, again, YouTube videos or things that were kind of in the media rather than um, any specific, uh, type of intervention. Uh, for all the kids that we've seen, uh, we, we provided a letter, um, supporting letter, um, if further assessment was recommended. Uh, so those are some of the things that we, or some of the, 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 the ways that we communicated strengths to parents. Um, so we would talk about kind of, um, you know, this person is more logical and literal in her thinking. She has a unique sense of humor. She's honest and has a preference to be more direct in her communication. Uh, in relation to relationships, she's very caring towards younger children and prefers to play with them over their same age peers. Um, other things around routine, organizational attention, concentration. So I think our view was to provide them with, you know, alternatives and focusing on strengths rather than medicalizing and, and, and using the words difficulties or different. So from the service, oh, sorry, that's another, piece in terms of sensory processing and special interests, for example. Now, those are some examples that we use. It doesn't mean that we use for all of them, uh, but some of, the, some of the language that we have been trying to incorporate. From a service perspective, um, I think when we started this pathway, the vast majority of kids referred to primary care were invited to these developmental clinics. And of those, more than 60% were referred to further autism assessment. Nowadays, this rate is about 50%. From a service perspective, 
this approach was efficient because it assisted us to deal with and reduce very long waiting lists, as well as um, you know, the possibility of diagnosing and informing parents and their kids of what was maybe originating the distress or, or strengths that the kids were presenting with. Um, I think this is when a more neurodiversity affirmative approach can make all the difference because we focus on strengths, qualities, what kids can do, their preferences, and that can be really transforming uh, to, to parents. And um, from a personal perspective, this approach is efficient, not only because it is strength based, but because it relates to a person. It respects their singularities and human rights. So that's me. I stopped sharing now. Juliana, thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's lovely to hear about, you know, a lovely, positive, gentle, strengths-based and person-based um, approach. Um, so um, now we're going to delve in a little bit deeper into some of the topics that were raised during the presentation. And um, I'll start with some um, with some questions and answers, if that's OK with our with our panelists. So. Um, I'm going to start with with our CAMS team with Sonia and Paula and um, the, we had really thought provoking questions for you and actually a lot of compliments about um, your presentation and your wonderful service so that's that's lovely to hear. Um, one question that's that's really interesting is is there any alternative for a young person or child who can't manage a group session? Yeah, so um, the, the group, the Being Me group is often just maybe one part of a, of a person's treatment mm -hmm. plan. So everybody who, who, who attends our service after their initial triage appointment will have like an individual care plan. So if it's raised in that, depending on the young person's needs, that, that a group setting may not benefit, then we do kind of discuss that as a team. And, and depending, you know, on the unique kind of needs of each person, there is obviously other kind of different you know treatment interventions we have occupational therapy psychology nursing staff um and sometimes we actually do a little bit of individual work to try kind of you know work up and support to maybe attending the group um down the line okay thank you for that that's great um another question for you um and um yeah, I think this is a is an interesting one. How do you find the time for for <laughs> these groups and um, this process um, alongside the usual CAMS work? <laughs> There's only so many hours in the day, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. um, well, well uh, firstly, I suppose this is usual CAMS work. So um, we are um, a service that supports young people in their mental health needs, specifically moderate to severe levels. Um, and we very much see this group as part of that. Um, you know, although we don't have the research to back it up, uh, we very much see that um, a lot of the reasons why a young person might be attending our group um, with moderate severe mental health concerns um, is, is, is because um, they, they are either struggling with identity, they don't know that they're autistic, um, they do know that they're autistic and are struggling with that, and um, the, the environment is not uh, set up or conducive to them living an authentic autistic life, uh, and we very much see this group as uh, a way of exploring all of that and a way of supporting young people in understanding their needs and advocating for themselves and again with parents as well like um you know giving a different framework to think about autism um, and understanding autism lends itself to advocacy and um truer understanding uh, for both parents of the young person and the young person of themselves uh, so we very much see it as the usual work of cams it is it is an intervention for mental health um, uh, so it is within our usual work. Thanks, civilian, for that for that answer. Um, another question that's come in, and um, yeah, it's 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 another interesting one. Um, it sometimes it's difficult for clinicians to be neuroaffirmative if the label of ASD still includes disorder. Um, do you use this label with a young person, or how do you explain this to to a young person in your service? 
So yeah, well, we try to, to model language use and, and that's something that we've, you know, we have, you know, learned, you know, through through our, you know, our, our, our looking outwards and our, our working with the community. Yeah. And so we are trying to model the more neuroaffirmative like language use, like like Sonia mentioned, you know, in our feedback sessions, in our, in our you know, in our triage appointments, um, in our reports. Um, so we we use the word autism mm -hmm. um, but I suppose in our in the being me group you know we do acknowledge that the word like mm. the, the term ASD is out there you know mm. we're, we're open about that and we do discuss mm. that in the group and with with both the young person you know and the parents um in fact we, we go through all the all the different labels throughout history so we look at all the different ways to refer uh, to refer to an autistic person we look at identity first versus person first language we we, we talk about all those things so it's not a, a big secret or anything like that because these are labels that these families and these young people are going to come up against um and we talk about the benefits and disadvantages of all these things and the discussions that are happening out there in the autistic community um, and like Paula said, we, we very much model the language um, on our team. Uh, what I will say is that that does take a lot of time and a lot of uh, effort. I think mm. we've mentioned in the first night that, um, you know, our, all of our trainings as clinicians and professionals, I'm, I'm hoping it's changed, but um, for all of us going through training, it very much was ASD. Um, yeah. And to, to switch um, does take a bit of effort. It doesn't take a long time, but it does take a bit of effort mm. at the very beginning to become consciously aware of it and to consciously change that. Um, and on our team, you know, we have, um, we started this thing that if someone slips up, we name it as well. So um, we, we are mm. trying in as much as we can um, to, to be that model of change for families and to have that right from the very beginning when, when they come to their service, that that is the way we talk about autism. Um, so we, we tend to, to try and avoid um, ASD. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Um, probably a more um, closed question here, but um, the ages of children and young people in, in the group? Great question. Yeah, that was something <laughs> actually that we probably should have clarified a bit more um, in the group. Um, so the Being Me group is, is for teenagers. So we, we from, from 12 onwards, I suppose, because that tends to be the, the cohort that, that we see um, you know, most often within the service. But mm. the parent group is open to, to parents of, of, of younger children. Okay. As well. Yeah. And then just um, I know there's three sessions, but the length of the sessions, um, Paula and Sonia. For the young people. Uh, yeah. oh yeah. So um that has varied as well from, from mm -hmm. group to group too. Um and it's it's hard to get the magic number, I think. Um mm -hmm. it always seems too less though. <laughs> when we finished, we were like, we could have done with a few more. Um, <laughs> But we, when we ran it as a camp, uh, it was five days in a row. Um, so we ran it as five sessions. Um, okay. And then when we were running it over, uh, when we were running it two sessions a week, we had it as six sessions. So we haven't found that magic number yet, but um, we, I don't think we ever will. Uh, but uh, yeah, probably around six sessions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I was just gonna say, the parent was was three sessions, which we think we probably mm -hmm. need to add more sessions on, but, mm -hmm. but the younger person session was always, yeah, around, kind of five, six. Um, okay. Questions. Okay. Paul and Sonia, thank you so much. And thank you for answering those um, questions just so uh, clearly and concisely. Thank you very, very much. And um, I'm just going to look in the questions and answers just to see what um, what, um, qu what questions might be there for um, Juliana. Um, so bear with me, Juliana here. Um, I remember when seeing Juliana's curiosity in action showed what could be lost by following a checklist too rigidly and it served an important learning experience. I'm very grateful for that. So that's just a, a lovely comment, Juliana. Um, so another question for Juliana. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. How do you manage the referral on from primary care for children or young people, um, autistic children and young people um, when waiting this are long um, and for this for this person who's asking the question this is often a very difficult part of of the process yeah um I, i'm not sure if i fully understand the understood the question but i i tried to answer it so mm. um i think what we are doing is 
like we are primary care and as primary care we don't work as a team per se mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so we work multidisciplinary uh, so therefore psychology is the only kind of you know um, um, discipline that 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 is there so in a way we we can't diagnose autism in primary care not yet you know with mm -hmm. all those changes i don't know uh, what is going to happen but the way that things are at the moment is that kids need a multidisciplinary um team to assess them for autism therefore we have to refer those kids to to a different service uh, so what we are trying to do to catch you know is to is to avoid and prevent kids that could be uh, autistic to become cams clients or patients in the future mm -hmm. so the early you know so the the idea is that and again i know it's only possible because i was very lucky to have excellent ap's and trainees working with me um, which shouldn't be the way. But in our service, every referral is screened. So therefore they might be waiting for, for two, three months, maybe four to be seen and a decision is made. Is, is, is made. So it, that's what we can provide. I know that in other services that we, that we are implementing that as well. And the waiting is, is longer, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if I've answered the question. I think you have, Juliana. Thank yeah. you so much for that. This is a question to the to the general panel. Um, can any of you recommend um, a TED talk to help autistic young people to develop a positive autistic identity? And I have my pen at the ready here. <laughs> Um, we do use a lot of them in, in the group and mm. um, mm. I'd be hesitant to start naming out things, but, um, yeah. you know, if, if you put into um, a TED Talk autism, uh, the majority tend to be neuroaffirmative, but uh, just to contextualize a little bit, when we do mm. the TED Talks, we discuss around it. So we haven't yet come across a perfect TED Talk. Okay. Um, so what we do is we, we play them and we, we discuss them, uh, either good or bad. Um, mm. Uh, and we look at language use across time as well and things like that. And um, so we'd also be interested to hear if other TED Talks <laughs> that perfectly explain uh, what it is to be autistic yeah. and um, are neuroaffirmative. But yeah, mm -hmm. we, we tend to um, take our lead from, from social media quite a lot. So mm -hmm. things are shared that are, mm -hmm. have got positive reception from the autistic community. We'll take note of that and we'll play it. Uh, we don't have a centralised list though. They tend to be very fluid and moving. Mm -hmm. Thanks a million for that. Jessica, if I could direct a question to you, um, would you have any advice on sensitive language use, um, I suppose, when talking about or talking to autistic people? I think um, there's been pretty good research to suggest that, well, and from being a member of the autistic community, that we like identity first. So we like mm -hmm. autistic person rather than person with autism or on the spectrum and mm. um, I think where, when it comes to maybe with parents and stuff I think parents I, I think Sonia might have said something like this but parents um their language they first hear the language from from professionals so the language that professional uses can really influence what parents like so starting off with neurodiversity affirmative language I think is is really good to kind of have that as your pillar pillar is the wrong word and um, but yeah autistic and I think in terms of maybe I don't think it's necessary to say autism spectrum disorder or either ASD or ASC anymore mm -hmm. I think it just makes a lot more sense to say autism because yeah. it is it's just a different neurotype um I don't think we really need to include the word disorder or condition at all anymore it doesn't mm -hmm. add anything Yes, th th thanks so much um, for that, Jessica. And just as a, a fellow autistic person, I'd, I'd really agree with everything you've just said there. So thank you, Jessica. Um, this is a question maybe for the CAMS team. Um, so how would we support an autistic young person who views their autism in a very negative way? 
Yeah, I suppose that's the whole purpose of of what we're trying to do. Um, mm-hmm. because if they're viewing it in a very negative way, then it, it it's you know it's no surprise that they they're attending a camps. Uh, mm-hmm. Because how, how do you how do you uh, cope with that? How do you see yourself? And um, that's obviously going to lead to um self esteem concerns. It's going to lead to masking or like um a rejection of the authentic self. Um, so you know what we try and do in our team is um you know try and allow space for that young person to talk about that and to listen to other autistic people within the group with the the content that we share and to explore that to learn about different perspectives and oftentimes the negative perception of a label comes from um, stigma or comes from a perception of what autism is so broadening that understanding of autism becomes really important um, and hearing at that neuroaffirmative stance and neuroaffirmative perspective is really important um, and meeting other autistic people that you can relate to also becomes really important. Um, so on our team, we're trying to facilitate that as much as possible um, through, uh, for example, those groups. OK, thank you so much for that. Um, I think we have um, I'm just looking back up through the through the list of questions and I think we have covered the main theme of the questions here. Just let me check here as well, just um, just in case. um, I think we might actually be done slightly ahead of time tonight. Isn't that amazing? Um, Can I suggest something just on Mm Sanchez's last answer? Um, yes, of course, Jessica. That's just that I think it is really pos- uh, oh, Maybe I haven't processed what I'm going to say out loud yet, but I'll try. Um, but just the building self-awareness. I, I think if somebody struggles with being autistic, it's it's good to kind of explore it with them why they think that and why it's more maybe that they might be taking on outside views rather than inside mm-hmm. and also kind of just exploring how it can be, how it can be, it can be a wonderful thing as well and that's not the point I was going to make it at all but it, um I'll stop now because I can't remember what I was going to say sorry yeah um so I just really like to thank um all the panelists for just um fabulous contributions um tonight um like it's been all so informative and um and thought-provoking um so thank you very much thank you to all the attendees for again very thought-provoking um questions um that is absolutely you know they they kind of generated a really good um discussion there um so thank you very much for that i just like to remind everyone um sorry i'm trying to find my notes here and speak at the same time um so i just like to remind everyone of the final um the final night um the final night the final uh, webinar um just bear with me for a second um so it's going to be on adapting to a neurodiversity affirmative paradigm in child and adolescent clinical services and how to apply all we have this to how how to apply all of this to autism diagnostic assessments and report writing so please do visit the psi events page to register for the event if you haven't already done so and please remember if you do require cpd points to email autism at psychologicalsociety.ie. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending tonight. And thanks again to all our panelists. Um, Good night, everyone. Thank you.